So as I said, I'm, so as I said I'm Colleen Tierling. I'm an entomologist with the Maine Forest Service. I'm not the, the primary person who works with brown tail moth, luckily. Um, but but I am very familiar with it and, and have, have you know, we all have been working with it. Um, so this all came about because I came and talked to Don and said, you know, there's, you know, I've heard of some of the other libraries in the state, or, or there might be another library in the state that had a pair of pole pruners to lend out to people. Is that something you might, might want to do or might be able to do? And she just jumped right on it and got these wonderful pole pruners to lend out to people to, to, uh, to prune the webs out. So today is just sort of a little bit of an information session. Um, and then a demonstration. So uh, brown tail moth, I'm sure you guys all know it's an invasive species that came from, from um, Europe. Came in the late 1800s and when it first arrived there was this huge effort throwing everything at it. They went to Europe and got all sorts of parasites which now we would never bring over because they were generalist parasites that attacked some of our own species. Um, and they were using like pesticide with you know arsenic and who knows what in them and and they were you know having kids paying kids bounties i think you five cents for every hundred webs that they clipped and brought in and, and so there was a huge effort to try to reduce the number of, of brown tail moth and that and whatever else you know it, it did seem to work and, and brown tail moth sort of it, uh, going, it went from being all over the, the state and all over through much of the Maritimes and through uh, parts of New Hampshire and Massachusetts to just down a little area um, on, on Cape Cod and sort of in the Casco Bay area of, of Maine. And it was kind of low for, for a long time. Every once in a while we'd have what we called outbreaks. We look at that now and think we wouldn't even consider that an outbreak because they were the you know, little outbreaks like this and then the last five years, the numbers started to rise like this. And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. We do know, we long suspected that it was related to climate change. Um, and and uh, there's just a paper that came out um, from research at the University of Maine in Orono that, that does confirm that. And it's not so much that the winters are milder, because these things are pretty protected inside their, their webs. Um, it's that they can feed longer in the fall. So um, let me just go back a little bit about the biology. So you guys probably remember seeing these little moths, white moths. The females have these little brown hairs around the base of, of, her, of her abdomen. And uh, that's why it's called brown tail moth. They were everywhere on buildings. They came to lights. Um, and and uh, so they lay their eggs in the, in the late summer and the caterpillars hatch in the late summer, early fall. And they're really small caterpillars at that time. They don't have the toxic hairs. And so they were um, out feeding in the tops of trees. And you may have noticed that some of the trees were getting, um, were getting defoliated or, or um, bronze. They didn't actually chew the whole leaf, but they just sort of chewed along the, uh, the epidermis of the leaf. And, and, uh, and so a lot of the trees looked like they were just turning brown way earlier than they normally would. And so those, those caterpillars fed. And because we're starting to have now longer and later falls, warm weather late into the fall, these caterpillars could feed longer and longer. And then they go into their winter webs. And uh, the winter webs are up on the tops of the trees. They basically are two or three leaves that the caterpillars silk together and um, and they spend the winter in there um, and it, any of those little webs can have anywhere from between 25 to about 400 caterpillars um, inside them and because they, they've had such long late warm falls they can eat longer and they can go into their into their webs as bigger more robust larvae and so they're better able to survive the winter. They come out bigger, they can feed more. And a caterpillar that feeds more turns into a bigger moth that can lay more eggs. And so the population just gets bigger and bigger. They're bigger, they're surviving better, they're laying more eggs. 
and that's largely due to the to the to the late warm feeding period in the late fall and then the earlier spring too just allows them to come out and start feeding earlier so that's probably why the numbers are a large part of why the numbers are rising and have been rising that does not bode well for the future because climate change is not going anywhere in the near future um, so this is something that for the medium term we have to learn to deal with it as much as possible um, so the caterpillars are now inside those little winter webs that we're going to learn how to cut out come spring they um, they crawl out um, they'll come out they'll crawl out even before the the uh, the, um, the leaves start to emerge and you can sometimes see them wandering around oh there's nothing to eat nothing to eat they go back into their web um, and then once the leaves start coming out, they start feeding. Uh, by the way, if anybody has questions, just interrupt me because um, I'd like this to be as informal as possible. So. Um, so how do you deal with, with brown tail moth? Yeah. What, what's the earliest you've seen them come out in the spring? Ah, I don't have that off the top of my head, but... Um, year I remember seeing them pretty early it was pretty early April we had some warm days and they were out and they were wandering and there was nothing for them to feed on yet so they tended to go back but they would wander during the day um, and because they they are they had fed well the, that long fall period before they were nice and big and robust they had lots of resources so they could they can hang they can wait it out um, and wait for the for the leaves to to emerge um, yeah if you cut the nest and it falls off, how likely is it to survive on the ground? Like, are Exceedingly the... likely. Okay. Um, that's <laughs> why I'm going to show you guys. The, so when you do cut the webs off, you can either dump them in a bucket of soapy water, and the soapy water will, will um, get through that, the, the silking and the webbing that, that surrounds that web, and they will drown. It has to be soapy water because otherwise the webbing just you know, keeps them completely dry in there. Um, so 24 to 48 hours of soaking in soapy water and they're good. You can also burn them in a bonfire if you're feeling particularly vindictive. Um, and, but you know, make sure you have you know, whatever permits you need to, to, to create a fire. Um, it's not like poison ivy. The poison ivy oil um, does not break down in heat. And so it's extremely dangerous to, to burn poison ivy. But brown tail moth, that toxin actually does get broken down by heat. And so you can burn it safely. Um, and uh, so for small trees, your absolute best way is to prune them out. You can get 100% of them. Um, there's zero environmental effect. Um, this is a time of year that it's fairly safe. Uh, there are mm -hmm relatively few hairs out there in in the environment right now um, and the young caterpillars do not have hairs on them i would sort of qualify that by saying if you are sensitive to brown tail moth hairs use protective gear when you're when you're clipping them off i am very sensitive and and if you you know if you're working in an area where there's a lot of of uh, a lot of webs like say this there's a good chance that, that that tree was heavily infested the year before. So there's probably a lot of hairs just sort of stuck onto the twigs and then crevices and just hanging around there. And so even though the caterpillars themselves and the winter webs do not have, have, uh, have hairs on them, there's just could be residual hairs. The other thing that, that I should mention is that the brown tail moth toxin, the, the, the hairs, the toxin in the hairs, will last for three years, which is really distressing. So if you are in, um, say, cleaning out your gutters or something like that early in the spring and you think, oh, it's too, too soon for brown tail moth, there's no hairs right now. Um, but if you had brown tail moth the year before, those hairs are going to be in the gutter. And if you start stirring them up, you could end up having a, a horrible rash. Um, I should also mention that you guys probably already know this, that, um, that not only do the brown tail hairs give you a rash, if you inhale them and if you're sensitive to it, 
essentially that rash that you have on your skin, you can get in your lungs and your, and your bronchial tubes. And so people can get pulmonary edema. People have ended up in the hospital. Uh, so just be careful. Masks are wonderful. They work for more than just COVID. Um, you can, a, a mask will, will stop you from wearing, or from, from uh, breathing in the hairs. And you know, for me, that's, I, when I started wearing a mask the last couple of years, I've had far less in terms of, of uh, asthmatic response um, to, to brown tail moth hairs. So um, I will continue to do that, yeah. Are there particular trees that they nest, they prefer to nest in? Or? Yes. They have a really wide host range. The favorite ones are the oaks, which is bad because they're huge and, and you know hard to deal with. But then the other the other favorite family is the apple family. So apples and crab apples and hawthorns and pears, um, and and even rose bushes. But there is a really wide host range, and so we find them some on on uh, elms and birches. I'm finding I'm seeing a bunch of birches this year. As the population rises, they will go on to almost everything. They'll go on to maples. They'll, um, so, yeah. but, but oaks and apples is where they will start to start with. Another thing that we, oh yeah. Um, for wearing your protective gear after like you come in, is it just straight to the washing machine and that will, yes. the soap from that will help? So depending on how sensitive you are, you might want to just you know, strip right down at the front door, bundle it off and put it in the washing machine. Hot water, but most importantly, put it in the dryer because okay. the, dry, the heat of the dryer will break down the toxin. Okay. The hairs are, are barbed. So not only are there the hairs that you can see, um, <clears throat> yeah, so you, know, the, the, you can see all the hairs on, on, the, on the brown tail moth. Um, so those are, are toxic, but they're also a lot of microscopic hairs. And you will never see them. They will fly right through your screens. They will work, and they're barbed, so they'll work their way through your, through your clothing. Um, so it doesn't come out of the clothing that easily, but if you, if you um, neutralize the toxin by heat, putting it in your dryer, that generally takes care of it. Cool. Um, your rope tape. Uh, yes, and so what I do, because I am so ridiculously sensitive, I carry a roll of tape with me everywhere. I have one in the glove compartment of my work truck and, and in my personal car and in my knapsack. Um, so if you are out and you think you may have been exposed to brown tail moth hairs, or if you get home and you start to feel that characteristic, you know, burning um, itchiness, and you start to see that little pimply rash, um, listery rash start to form. Um, the hairs are in your skin and will stay there and will continue to release that toxin into your skin for hours. So what I will do is just take a piece of tape and put it on my whatever exposed skin or wherever I feel like I'm starting to come up with a rash, pull those hairs off. And if you do that before you have a shower, um, you're gonna get rid of much more of the hairs because just taking a shower when you come in after you know being potentially exposed to brown tail, um, may not get those barbed hairs out of your skin if they've already started to you know got themselves embedded because they do have those little barbs. Um, let's see what else. This cold weather isn't affecting them, is it? Probably not much. Um, they're they're fairly well protected inside their their um, their little webs, it doesn't seem to make that much of an effect, have that much of an effect. Um, maybe a little bit, but. How come the birds don't pick that up? Uh, we wondered about that. Um, yeah, certainly the birds will not, will not go after the big mature larvae with their toxic hairs because that's why they have the toxic hairs is to stop, you know, stop predators from feeding on them. But the, in the webs, we have occasionally seen crows just sort of go pecking at them. You're probably curious wondering what they are. But those webs are really, really tightly, um, tightly wound up. They, they're, they're wound up with silk. It's hard to get into them. Um, you know, if you try to pull apart a web, it's really tricky. Um, and, and so it's, it's hard to, for birds to get into them. So I go trim the top of all my crab apple trees. 
I can reach them, but I look up, there's a maple tree 70 feet in the air. What are you gonna do over there? So that is is the big question. And and there are there are companies that will come with cherry pickers and, and pick out or clip out the webs. Um, there are there are pesticides that can be injected into the tree that um, and, and treatment can be done in the in the spring or in, in late summer, early fall. And, and the pesticide goes up, it kills everything that's in that tree, everything that's feeding on that tree. So it's, it's a really big hammer um, and it's expensive. So it's not something you're wanna, gonna wanna do for all of your trees. But if you have a tree that's you know, right by your door, maybe that's something you wanna consider. So you mentioned that if it's right near your door, you might wanna consider that. So I am surrounded by red oaks and they are that picture over there is like every single tree for hundreds and hundreds of feet into the woods, completely around the house. They're crawling up our, the side of our house on our screens, everything, walking around, trying to pick them up, clip them out of the crab apple trees in the garden. They are so absolutely everywhere that they were quoting like ten and twelve thousand dollars to take care of just the issue around the house. Yeah. I I don't know what to say to you. I, I'm similar. I have about 12 or so giant oak trees right around where I live. None of the landowners are going to do anything about that. Um, so then go to our website. Um, and there's there's information there on the back about, you know, there's um, basically a list of, of you know, hundreds of, of questions and answers and and tips on mitigating your exposure, and that's you know what you have to do. I mean, for me, as much as I hate doing it, come beginning of June, I close my windows. I don't open them up until July. Um, if you if you're mowing your lawn, do it early in the morning when it's very dewy, so you don't stir up all of those hairs. Um, it, it basically comes down to mitigating your your exposure to the to the hairs which is a really crappy answer, I'm sorry. Um, Self-preservation kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, oh, I was just gonna say, I have a problem with them. Uh, we get our tree, we got our tree clipped last year. We got, I don't know, 12 trees cut down because the cost of doing it every year is not even close to just cutting it down. Yeah. Which is a shame, it's, it's horrible. Or, yeah, it's miserable, yeah. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> How many times can they trip a tr strip a tree down before it kills a tree? So, that's actually a really good question. Um, these insects, um, because of this weird life cycle that they have, that they, they hatch in the fall, and then they, they, they strip all the, the, the uh, leaves off, and then they, they um, will feed on that tree the, fo the following spring and they feed really early and they um they will pretty much do, they can pretty much defoliate a whole tree but they do it early on and trees can then have a second flush of leaves so that second flush of leaves is a little bit tougher has a different smell and a different taste because this tree is trying to protect itself by you know because it knows it's been defoliated in that spring and, and so that next crop of leaves is, is tougher and, and has more you know, harmful chemicals in it, harmful to the insects. So then when the caterpillars hatch out and these females hatch out in the middle of the summer, they are going to not go back to that same tree where they came from because that tree has tough leaves now. They're gonna go to a tree that was not defoliated last year that has you know, normal leaves. And that's where they will lay their eggs and so Brown tail moth has a tendency to sort of cycle back and forth from one tree to another tree. So if your tree was totally defoliated this year, there's a good chance it will have less next year. This, of course, is the situation when the populations aren't just utterly exploded. All bets may be a little bit off now. Um, we may end up seeing them start to kill trees. Um, and certainly brown tail moth can kill trees if it defoliates a tree early in the spring and then some other species comes along and defoliates it again in the in the later summer so it, it is possible but in general it tends not to be a tree killing pest that much yeah uh, if the uh, caterpillar 
come out early in the spring and uh, they're roaming around. And then there's like successive days of hard for us or it gets really cold again. Are they gonna survive the cold? They will because for, for the early part of the spring, they'll come out and they'll feed during the day and then they go back into their nest during oh, the night. Oh, they do. Oh, and okay. so they're really smart about doing that. Um, and and it's only later in the season when it's milder that they'll just stay out and oh, feed. Okay. However, yeah. um, that brings me to um, another point about uh, natural natural control. There is a fungus and there is a virus that that is out there in the population, um, and and these things will will kill the kill the brown tail moth. They're specific to brown tail moth, um, and so when we have cold wet springs they will tend to get, especially the fungus, and, and because we have a cold, wet spring, they will, you know, the fungus does well in, that, in those conditions, but then they also go back at, at night into their web, and they give the fungus to each other, and then they go out during the day, and they spread it around, and they come back, and they you know, give it to each other. And so that's why the fungus works really well, part of the reason the fungus works really well in cold, wet springs. And there were a few years where we had cold, wet springs, and, and we saw some localized just crashes down in sort of the central area, I think Freeport and places where there have been horrible brown tails for several years. The population crashed. And you know, we were gonna do some work with that and, and maybe try to spread that fungus around, take some cadavers of, of the, the brown tail rock cadavers and move them to you know, outlying areas where the fungus wasn't there yet. And then we got last year, which was just, you know, a, Last year, no, the year before, it was really droughty and, and, and a dry spring, and um, it just disappeared. The fungus disappeared. So it is out there, but we need cold, wet springs to, to get some control. Yes? I, I remember what I was going to say. It was, um, I got them clipped out of one tree, and then we wrapped a bunch of trees uh, with that. No, uh, but it's like around sticky. the trunk. Yeah, it's like sticky and they won't cross it. And every day you'd go out and there'd be a hundred underneath that band trying to climb up and we'd pick them all off. And I just Yeah, you know, I'm not sure how much that works for it. The bands work. work well for winter moth because <laughs> because the female does not fly. And the female moth does not fly, and so you can actually keep, tend to keep them out of, of individual trees somewhat. Um, if you if you cut if you clip them out and then wrap it, then they're not able to really eat it. If you get all of them out, uh, yeah, I suppose that's true because towards the later part of the summer, um, if if caterpillars and other trees have basically stripped that tree out and there's nothing left, you'll see these mature caterpillars, and that's when they're roaming around, and you'll see them crawling up the sides of garages and houses. Um, and you know, crawling up other trees, so you know they could have some effect at that stage. Yes. I, I well, the ones we wrapped were still had leaves. Okay. And then the ones that yeah, yeah well, like, yeah, then then that yeah, that might work. It does work a bit yeah, for the yeah. keeping the caterpillars from crawling yeah. back up, and were, yeah. they weren't. It wasn't completely uneaten, but it was. Okay. Well, that's less. yeah, that's good to know. Yeah. The other thing is if you if you do see you know these these armies of, of caterpillars just you know marching around and crawling up you know houses and things like that, taking a wet dry vac um, and putting you know two three inches of soapy water in the bottom of it, you can just again with with protection because the hairs are going to be everywhere. You can carefully just vacuum them up and they'll drown in the soapy water and then you can you know dump them in the garbage or compost pile. Uh, a different question. Last year, the city treated inoculate. Is that the right word? Some of the trees on our city common. Um, several of them are over a children's playground. Some are over a commemorative fountain where a lot of kids and people congregate. Yeah. It did slow them down. But what's the next stage in that? Does that make the tree more desirable the next year? Is there any residual protection, or does it have to be done every year? It pretty much needs to be done every year. Unlike, say, for hemlock woolly adelgid, where you can put a systemic in it and it will last for a few years because it hangs onto the needles, a deciduous tree will drop its leaves and, and next year we'll have a new crop of leaves. So you know, I'm not an expert on, on the pesticides for certain. That would be Tom, who's our lead on brown tail moth. Um, 
but generally it's probably going to have to be done every year, uh, I think. Is there any actual impetus by the state to have municipalities have a treatment program? I mean, people freak out as soon as they see the white moss. It's like, no, no problem unless you are, are aware of it. Yes. When they see the white moss, uh, so and the public goes crazy. Yeah, so and they're looking that's... for a response from the city or from the state. But that doesn't seem. Yeah, I, I agree, and and I cannot talk at all about anything political. Um, <laughs> well, the caterpillars are political. Yeah. Oh, brown tail moth is usually political. Oh, wow. But I do know that Maine is is starting to you know things are starting to happen in terms of, of funding and, and, and you know, there's, there's increased funding for research and, and you know, because in the past this was a tiny little, tiny little problem in a tiny little corner of Maine that nobody else in the country cares about. Um, and it still is just a little problem in a corner of Maine compared to the larger country, but, but we are start, there is starting to be some response. Um, yes, you are right that people tend to, in the winter, you guys are thinking about this, but most people don't think about it. And it's only when they're scratching their skins off because of the itch, or when they see all those moths, then people freak out. And those are the times when it's not really you know, time to do anything. Um, so yeah, I probably can't say anything about your know, challenge responses. Um, you know, at this point, the state is not treating trees. What we are doing is we're educating. We do um, uh, a survey and we do have a map on our website that shows, you know, we do a roadside survey looking at the, at the, uh, at the webs of the trees. Uh, so you can have an idea of where it is and how it's spreading from year to year. And this year, what towns are likely to be heavier hit than other towns. But really the only thing that you, that you, you really need to do is just go out into your own immediate surroundings and just look at what, where the webs are and then make your decisions about what you're going to do. We now have Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month. Yes, that's so February is. is Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month. Um, and, and we're trying to get people to be aware of it and, and clipping out webs. And, okay, there's the four R's and I never remember these things that are supposed to help you remember. Um, <laughs> uh, recognize, so that's one of the things we're doing is you'll learn to recognize it remove them and we're going to go out for a demonstration on how to remove them with with bull pruners uh, the one that i never remember recruit so if you cannot you know reach the the webs go and find somebody find a company that can you know now is the time of year to make a plan to to contact um, an arborist and make a plan for next spring because they're going to be flat out next spring if you wait till may to to try to contact somebody they're just going to laugh at you so, so now is the time to, to do that. And when then you the other- next spring, you mean this spring? The, sorry, this spring, yeah, <laughs> you know, they, Yeah, you wanna do it, you want, you want to make a plan now and contact your, your, your arborist now for this spring. And then the fourth R is just reach out because you can do whatever you want to on your trees, on your property, but if your neighbor doesn't bother pruning off the, the webs on their property, the hairs are just going to blow around. So, so brown tail moth is is dealt with best by 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 a group, by a community. Um, for me, you know, it was enlightened self interest when it was in small trees of my neighborhood. I went out with my pole pruners and said, "You've got brown tail moth. Do you mind if I cut it out for you?" Because that was to my benefit. And so, working together as a neighborhood, um, if you do decide to have some your trees treated. It's going to be cheaper if you can call somebody in to treat a bunch of trees on you know, all of your properties rather than you trying to treat yourself and then later you trying to do it yourself. Um, so those are the four R's. You said something about it being a main problem, but geographically, other states or where else are these things found? Um, well, largely Maine. There is a population in Cape Cod, but it's a small population and it tends to be just a little shrubby, shrubby things. Um, you know, beachy plants and, and shrubs and trees. Um, and so it's not a huge issue. It can be easily pruned out. It is moving inland. It is moving east. Um, and so we're starting to see it in New Brunswick. Um, New Brunswick is very concerned. We're, we're definitely, it's moving north. It used to be sort of just a coastal thing. We have found it now in every um, county in Maine. 
except for York County. Go figure. York that has everything else does not have not have brown tail moth. So it, it tends to be moving east, maybe with prevailing winds. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and and north and inland. We found it as far north. We've been finding webs up in Fort Fairfield, which is you know, way up in the county. So this is not something that we can count on it staying you know, right in the little coastal area. And people in other parts of, of the state have long thought, oh, well, it's a brown tail, it's a coastal issue. We don't need to worry about it here. It's like, yeah, you can't think that. Bangor is having issues. How, how uh, long did it, far a distance did the moths fly? Um, the females are big and heavy and don't fly a lot. Um, that's a good question, and I don't have a really good answer for that. I don't know. Um, that an, you know, the answer might be there around somewhere. Um, they it probably you know will depend on whether they if they get caught they can get blown. Um, we we'll find that with spruce budware, we can have whole clouds that just get blown hundreds of miles. Um, I don't know that that happens with with, uh, with brown tail, um, but but yeah, don't know. Sorry. I do know also the nests sometimes do come out, fall out occasionally. You know, one or two of them maybe. Yes. They, they're very light and they'll get blown really yeah. far too. Yeah. If you do see nice. webs on the ground, pick them up, put them in soapy water. Um, because anything you know on the ground, yeah, they'll get blown come spring, wherever they are, they'll <laughs> emerge and they'll just march and march until they find a tree that they can that they can feed on. They're really, really good at finding trees when they come out in spring because they're not they're not tiny baby caterpillars at that point in time. They're caterpillars that are you know three quarters away grown. Are there good webs we might confuse with bad webs? Yeah, um, so the brown tail moth webs are not even so much what you would consider to be webs. They basically look like two or three, um, two or three leaves that are just kind of stuck together and are just hanging on the tree. Um, and when we go out to look at them, I'll, I'll show you how to, how to identify them, but if you stand with the sun at your back and look up at them, one, they tend to be on the outside, the ends of the twigs, so they kind of are on the outside of the tree. And two, they will look like just little leaves, maybe a cluster of two leaves or so stuck together. And you can see the white webbing often of the silk that is attaching those leaves to the tree. Other webs that you will find um, in the spring, you can find um, eastern tent caterpillar webs, and they tend to be in the, in the crotches of, uh, or branches of trees. Um, and they'll, they'll start sort of in a crotch and, and, and they get these big webs and there's lots of, of cobwebby looking material. Um, and so that's in the spring. And so you can recognize that it's a big web. It's, it's you know, in the crotch of the tree. In the fall, there's fall web work. Um, and, and Eastern tent caterpillar is a native species. It does some damage, but it's not a huge issue most of the time. Um, fall webworm is something that's in the fall, and that's one that has great big, nesty webs. And, and every year we get calls saying, you know, the trees are dying because they're you know, sometimes your whole branches can be engulfed with these great big webs. Um, but you know, because it's late in the fall, and this is again another native species, it's late in the fall. The trees have done their photosynthesizing; they've already created their buds for the next year. This fall webworm is eating all the leaves. The tree just kind of shrugs and says, eh and it's fun in the next year. So those are some of the, some of the ones that are up there. Um, I think if you have, take a look at this. Yeah, there are some, some pictures of things that can be uh, uh, confused. And on the website, I think there are some more pictures as well. Oh, let me see, have I covered everything? A little bit about safety when, we're, when you're doing uh, brown tail pruning. We really recommend that you do it in pairs uh, because if you are there with you're know, looking up you know, with your brown with the, with the pole pruner, it helps to have somebody who's standing over there saying a little more to the right, a little more to the left, or go up a little bit further. Now you've got it. Now you flip it. Um, so and and then it's also good just to have somebody there watching you to be sure that you don't you know step backwards in, into a ditch or into traffic or something like that. So if you can have a spouse or a kid or a neighbor, you know, 
um, work with you when you're when you're uh, doing pole pruning. Uh, we have safety goggles, which are good because you're going to be working like this, pole pruning, looking up and and crap and leaves and bits of bark can fall down into your eyes, and so having safety glasses is good. Um, when you're doing this, stay on the ground. If, if the webs are too high for you to reach and you are tempted to you know, crawl up into the top of your pickup and, and use a pole pruner from there, don't. Because that way lies emergency room visits. Um, so staying on the ground is important. Um, stay away from wires. Stay away, yeah, stay away from wires. If, if you've got wires anywhere nearby, don't. Don't do it. Uh, don't don't cut them out because uh, you, you just you don't want to. This is a metal metal pole pruner. You don't want to risk any kind of uh, any kind of danger with wires. So this is some of the area have had this for quite a few years. Has it got worse or has it passed by that now? Well, for a while there, we were almost seeing a donut effect. So it's in the the area down down the Casco Bay, Freeport area, or Bath and Brunswick. Um, though that area was starting to get better because the, the uh, fungus was building up and the populations were crashing. And then as it sort of spread outwards, we were getting, you know, the worst, area, worst hit areas were the outlying areas where the brown tail moth had spread, but the fungus hadn't followed yet. Um, with, uh, with the uh, dry, hot, dry springs that we've had a couple of years, um, I'm not sure. I think the population might be starting to build up again in, in those areas. It, but it, it rises and falls in different areas, depending on depending on a lot of things that we don't even necessarily know. But certainly depending on on the fungus. Um, so you can't buy the fungus commercially. Then. No. You know, we are working on on uh, you know both the fungus and and the virus. To you know, is that something that can be can be used? In the future, um, there's also uh, a, a pheromone, a mating pheromone, that, that the females uh, emit for, for the males to come and, and mate with them. And, and so in Europe, that has been used to confuse them so that the males can't find the females. They, they end up going to, to these little, you know, little pheromone uh, emitters. Um, that's something that works well in Europe, where they tend to be not in the giant oak trees. For whatever reason, they tend not to go up in the oak trees in Europe. They tend to be down in hedgerows and, and, and some of the smaller trees. And so they can just go put out these emitters, there's pheromone emitters all throughout the, the area. Um, so, but you know, there is certainly some work being done on that. Um, one of the big issues with brown tail moth is that it's such a small issue in the greater scheme of things that there is so little research money. It's also a really miserable thing to work with. Um, you know, I know some very brave grad students who have been working with brown tail moth and they just endure the rash because even though they've got double gloves and they tape it to their necks and their wrists and, and, and double, you know, and, and, and coveralls and hoods, and it's like working with radioactive substances and they still get the rash. So uh, there, there is, Hopefully, going to be more research being done in the near future on ways. Uh, if you were ever going to work with, I recommend with, a, like you would do insulation with the Tyvek yes. suits Tyvek with the hood suit. and yep. eat, not. Oh, I wouldn't use the open. No, no, not the. I would use the ones that seal onto your face yep. and. Uh, and a respirator. You have a respirator. Yeah, oh, definitely. Too. Yeah. It's, it's a lot like insulation working with fiberglass insulation. Yes, yeah, very much so. And for people who are sensitive or people who are working for their jobs in areas where there is high, high amounts of that, yes, that, that's the kind of safety equipment they need. And, and depending on you know, what is in your property and, and what you are doing, you may want to do that. I had a, the trees cut down. We couldn't afford to have them like trim them out and take them, but we just had a problem and I went in and cut all the nests up because I know they would yes. come back. Yes, if you, yes. If you just Good left idea. them on the ground, they'd be yep. alive anyway. So I got all suited up like that with, uh, you know, her parents just said, and I didn't have any problem. I did 
like entries, like yeah. they were on the ground, but I cut them all up. I didn't have any made. I had my wrists. Right, so it was I, exposed. Yeah. Uh, and I did even take do the tape after, but even with all that, I still got a little, and but it did work okay. Yeah. To have the whole, you know, you feel ridiculous. You're out there, you know, it's like um, April, and it's nice. People are wearing shorts and you're full. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, for for those of us who have worked with brown tail moth, yeah, we've we've got the Tyvek suits and the hoods and the and the and the goggles um, that sit on your eyes and. and I think some people even have the respirators. Um, it feels really silly, but it it can it, it will that protect next you when day it's bad. you don't have anything. You feel really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you talk about the calicos. What about trying to do something with the moss? Uh, one example is I recommend not killing them on your siding because my son one day went through and killed. Now we got stains all over our. Uh, <laughs> uh, siding. But is there something that we could do with, like, with, I know it's the after effect, but is there something that we could do with the moss? At this point, probably not much. There, you know, this whole, this whole sex pheromone thing is, is something that in the future may be something we could do with the moss. Um, there are people that use light traps uh, because the, the brown tail moss come to life, and I should also mention this is during the flight season, turn off all your outside lights because otherwise the brown tail moths will come to your lights because they really like the lights. So if some people were using light traps and you know killing thousands of, of moths, I'm thinking, yeah, we're doing wonderful things. Except for the fact that it's usually the males that come right to the light, and the females are attracted to the general area of the light, but they hang out in the trees around the light. And as the males come to the light, they can mate with the females, and then they go to their desks in the light trap. And people think they've done great things, and it really hasn't done much. It's sort of as like uh, when you put up the Japanese beetle trap, and you can get tons and tons of Japanese beetles in your Japanese beetle yeah. trap, but you just you're drawing them in from greater areas. So, a light trap is probably not something that's a good thing to do for for uh, brown tail moth. I uh, I tried to make one. I got a ton of them. Still all over the trees. Does not work. Yeah. Yeah. So do we want to help? Oh, sorry, yes. Um, I have killed a lot of moths by stepping on them. Is that okay? That work? Certainly it's fine to step on them. The moths themselves um, don't have a lot of hairs um, that are toxic on them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, towards the end of the season, um, you know, or after we had some heavy rains and the moths just fell out of the trees, that's probably because they were on their way out and they were probably going to die anyway. But stepping on them, why not? Yeah. <laughs> it makes me feel better. <laughs> and, and you know, they might not make it back into the trees, but they might. You know, so yeah. How about the the uh, the the uh, west the, the ones that fall off? If you step on them and cross them, we will go to the Um. <laughs> it's you're probably better off to put them in a bucket, pick them up, and put them in a bucket of soapy water. Yeah. Just because the caterpillars are fairly small still, and and you might not kill them all, and then. You know, as soon as it warms up, they're gonna crawl out of that, you know, kind of smushed up mess and, and go looking for the nearest tree. <laughs> my grandson came because my trees were just covered with caterpillars. And he sprayed them with an organic caterpillar spray. And it killed all the caterpillars that were on the trees. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it was organic because these trees are in my vegetable garden. So I didn't want anything in the garden. So there is, um, there's something called BTK, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, it yeah. and it's specifically for caterpillars. It's it, it, um, it's a bacterial toxin basically that they have to eat. And so if you do it early on in the season, so right. that when there's still leaves, um, and you and the spray the leaves and the caterpillars eat the leaves, they will die. Often it takes a couple of treatments. Um, it can also work well in the fall when the caterpillars are smaller. Um, so that that is certainly something these that, that can work. The caterpillars were just coming, you know, running up and down the trees, etc. I couldn't get into the garden, Charlene. Yeah. Told me to give up my garden that year, but I couldn't do it. So uh, I had yeah. to get rid of the caterpillars. So I have one anecdotal, yeah. secondhand story that I heard about. 
um, someone who was uncovering a wood pile, taking a tarp off. Oh, no. And so it wasn't in the trees, but it somehow all these fibers were, were in. They had fallen uh, down onto the tarp, probably. That could be. Yeah, or the in cracks the of the tarp. And he like shaken up and just covered his body and he turned red and went to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, and okay. so that's that's why I was saying, you know, you know, if you're your eaves or taking the cover off your boat in the spring or any place, just think about where the hairs could have accumulated from last wind, last summer when the hairs were really bad, where they could have fallen and accumulated. They're still there this spring, and and that that toxin lasts for three years, and so just be aware of that. You. Know, the hairs that fall onto the ground, you get rain, they get stepped on, it gets kind of warped into the ground. It's less of an issue, but any place where, like, like that, yeah, that's a huge, huge concern because people at this time of year aren't thinking about the hairs. Mm -hmm. I heard you say, though, that the moths don't have a lot of hairs, it's the caterpillars. Right? Yeah, it's the caterpillars that have the hairs. The moths themselves, although they are hairy, they, they don't have the toxic hairs. Okay. It's, it's the caterpillars, and it's specifically the older stages of the caterpillars, the ones that are around in the spring. So do we want to head outside? You want to show the pole first? Oh, okay, yeah, so the pole pruner. Um, and you don't have to use both if it's not. Yeah, you can use just one, so we've got the. Um, they, they attach together. Let's see, maybe a. I will, well, I'll maybe put it together now. I think I can get it out the door. Yeah. Um, because it's easier to do that when the hands are warm and not cold. So they just attach together. It's still a little fresh. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's still brand new. So you align the, the you holes. You align the holes, put the little tab in there, um, and then. We have two attachments. One is a saw attachment. Um, and you would put that on the end and you can just basically saw something this way up high. Uh, most of the time, you are probably going to want to use the pruner attachment, which will attach on the top. And you pull the, so there's the pruner there. You pull this and, uh, and you, you can clip the branch. Um, most of the time you're going to want to do this. If some of your, your webs are too high and you can't reach it with a full pruner, you could use a saw and just saw off a branch if you wanted to a little lower onto the tree. And I should mention, you will only do this on trees that you have permission to do this. So you're not going to you know, go off into your neighbor's tree or something like that and start sawing off branches as much as I would really kind of like to. So my neighbors. Um, it's the same kind of attachment there. And it's the same attachment here. So you, you just line the up the holes. Pole, you can attach it to just the bottom hole, or you can have this whole length. Yeah. Does this kind of a full saw allow you to get additional sections? Probably mm -hmm. still not. This and you not this one, I believe. I don't know. I don't know. You probably could buy one could more be, uh, yeah. in between. We heard um, true. But, but there are different types of pole saws which have different ones. The ones that we use at work have four lengths this long. And I can handle two, maybe three. And after that, I'm just way too short to deal with that. I, just, I don't have the leverage and it's kind of going all over the place. The longest one I've ever seen on the line is 30 feet. That's, they don't really make many that are over that. Yeah. You now people who who do uh, you know pruning for, or sampling for for spruce bud work can get way up there, but not me. So that's what that's what you will get from the library. Nice little tote, the glasses, the the saw blade, and the and the the pruner. Um, anything else you want to say about that? You know, I didn't think so. Um, do we do we fill our bucket too and bring it? Yeah. Out so. Bucket of soapy water, unless you're feeling that. We don't provide the bucket, although maybe we will. Pardon? <laughs> maybe we'll add a bucket to that. We need a flat bucket. Can we use uh, yours? Um, yeah. Something that you guys should do is uh, when you mow your lawn, bag it. Use a bagger mower. Yes, so it's not uh, And then be around. careful when you are dumping it. The best. Yep. Yep. Um, There's just all sorts really of really good ideas. 
So is that like a tablespoon of soap or? It's a good glop. Um, <laughs> if you use lots, that's not a problem. Yeah. You, you just want to be able to break down the surface tension of the web so that the water gets in and breaks also breaks down the surface tension of, on the, the caterpillar. Cool. Um, so dish soap, any? Dish soap, hand soap, any kind of soap. Okay. Should we have? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, we have a little bit, a little bit too high. It's a little bit tricky sometimes. There, getting it in the right spot. There you go. Wait's not open. Do I have it? Wait's not open. Oh, the plate's not there. Go. Okay, there yep. Go. See that, thanks. Nope, nope. Oh, see, this is why you do it with two people. Yeah. Because I can't see from my vantage point. Okay. Now pull it down. There you okay. go. I think it should be okay. Yeah. There you go. So, would anybody else like to try? I go. And that silk then would shine in the sun and, and help you identify it. So how but many basically... caterpillars do you suppose are in there? That's two actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 See, this is why this is why birds just can't eat them. I, yeah. I have trouble even yeah. opening that up. But there could be there could be fifty in there easily. Wow. It's a lot more economical to cut a net than to try to kill the caterpillars or not. Yes, absolutely. This is the the time where you get the the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking I've got some, some big oak trees in my front yard. No way I'll yeah, you, you're the big oak trees, you're going to have to do something else, probably a pesticide, or just try to you know, mitigate your exposure to the hairs. I have visions, I have a, a maple tree that's 
you know, maybe 20 years old. It's not a massive thing. It's like getting a, a rope with a weighted end on it to just try to pull some of the, bend some of the branches down. Would it be within reach? Depending on how big your, your maple tree is, I think that and might it, be. Even if I decided to start sawing away, it'll sort of, will it reshape itself? Yeah, I mean, yeah, because you've got the, the rope on there. Uh, if, if you were to say, if, you know, if this was way up too high, you couldn't reach it, but you could reach down here, you could just saw that branch up there. Um, that, that's another possibility. Pardon? Well, you could. Uh, the library and the bank would probably be happy if you did. Colleen, do you think a tree of this size, it would be easier to use just the one pole? It might. If you get, you know, the very highest one, maybe have two poles and then after that, just one pole, yeah. It also depends on how tall you are. Uh, a tall man with a lot of upper body strength can hold a pole like right. this and do it. For somebody like me, I might want to brace the pole on the ground and, and do that. So it's, it's a, really a matter of um, yourself and what works for you. You do not have to do all of this if you don't want to. But you're doing an excellent job. Is there still stuff up there? Or is that little, uh, I think that is one there, that on the end. Yes. You could cut it further back down the thing if you want, further down the branch. Where that go? There. You got it. <laughs> Are there? Um, you mentioned that here it's more often the tall trees, but in other places it's like shrubs. Is there are there shrubs that we should be watching for here as um, well? Or? Certainly, I think in Cape Cod they were finding it on things like beach plum. Anything related to the apple family, you definitely would find it on. Um, I see it just driving down the sides of you know, on, on shrubs on the sides of the roads. It's winter and I don't even have any idea what, what species some of these little shrubby things on the sides of the roads are. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, you don't always look up. It might be, be yeah, worth it, it to look. Yeah, it may be along the, the, the lower branches too. more than you expected. Yeah. Yeah, and here's one that just had you know, a couple of, of dried up um, crab apples on it. Turns out there's no brown tail moth there. No big deal. Better to turn it down to be safe.
You don't have to keep doing this if you don't want to. Oh, I'm getting tired of this. Okay. okay. Their thing is a little bit too much. Okay. For a lot. Okay. Good, thank you. <laughs> yes, get those grandsons on it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Terrific. Okay. People were asking about what's inside. See a bunch of cast skins in there. You can't even really Ugh. see the caterpillars. Right. They're pretty small. Oops. See, I don't really know whether I'm sensitive to them or not. Just assume that you are and try not to find out. Yeah. Because I can show you a horror show picture. Oh. Oh, is this the guy who would have fired the wood pot? No, no. This was That's not, not even that bad. No, this is... I don't know if I want to see it, John. How bad dreams. <laughs> no, it's not that. <laughs> but it's... Um... <laughs> yes, get those grandsons on it. Yes, absolutely. Terrific. People were asking about what's inside. See a bunch of cast skins in there. You can't even really Ugh. see the, the caterpillars. Right. They're pretty small. I don't really know whether I'm 
Sounds like you them or not. Just assume that you are and try not to find out. Yeah. Because I can show you a horror show picture. Oh. Oh, is this the guy who would have fired the wood pot? No, no. This was this not good. even that bad. No, this is... I don't know if I want to see it going. Probably bad <laughs> dreams. No, it's not that. But it's... Um,